have to um, close down the inquiry out of the respect for families that are having a difficult time. Tonight, the Inu inquiry in Labrador takes an unexpected break. What is the RCMP doing about this in terms of, you know, compiling appropriate evidence so that these cases don't fall through the cracks? Plus, the RCMP is questioned over human trafficking. First Nations leaders and members on the ground are clear. They have never seen it this bad. And a growing call for help in First Nations in northern Manitoba. Good evening, Tanse Anin. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. The inquiry into the treatment, experiences, and outcomes of Inu youth in provincial care will be delayed as further meetings for the rest of the week have been suspended. A reporter on the ground in Labrador, Angel Moore, explains. I'm here at the Sheheshe First Nation, about 40 kilometers north of Happy Valley Goose Bay. This morning, where community meetings were scheduled to take place at the youth center, Commissioner Anastasia Cupe announced that an elder had passed in the community. Then we have to um, close down the inquiry out of the respect for families that are having a difficult time. The decision to shut down the inquiry came from the community and leadership and those scheduled to share their stories so the community can come together and mourn. Commissioner James Igliroite had this to say. The people who wanted to give their statement today have been very generous, they're very understanding, and they've said, no, we'll be ready the next time. Elder Elizabeth Panashaway was scheduled to share her story. Instead, she closed today's meeting, but had this to say. I'm very sad. I'm very worried. Sometimes when I stay in my house by myself, I cry. What's going on now? What's going on? So many people, so many people sick, so many people died. Young people and old people. The inquiry is delayed until further notice. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Sheheshe, First Nation. As First Nations in northern Manitoba continue to struggle, the MP for Churchill Kiwait Nukaski is joining the growing number of voices calling for help. Leanne Sanders has more. MP Nikki Ashton didn't mince words in question period today. First Nations leaders and members on the ground are clear. They have never seen it this bad. What will it take for this government to act on the humanitarian crisis that is destroying families and First Nations right now? She represents the riding where a number of crises have rocked communities and recently she visited several of them. Mr. Speaker, First Nations in our region are in crisis and the government is missing in action. In God's River, God's Lake Narrows and Oxford House, drugs are destroying people's lives. Manitoba RCMP just reported the homicide of a young woman in God's Lake yesterday. There have been 10 homicides on First Nations in Manitoba since the new year, with both Shimatawa and Opi Panipiwan declaring states of emergency in recent weeks. The situation is grim. Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu responded to Ashton, but provided no concrete solutions in the forum. Mr. Speaker, uh, recently I visited God's Lake, and I can tell you that the member is right, that we have to do more together to protect members of that community, and all communities, Mr. Speaker, that are struggling under the weight of a colonial system that has not invested in their prosperity. Ashton says communities are in crisis due to lack of housing, high cost of living, and unemployment. She demanded immediate action from the government. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Winnipeg Centre MP Leah Gazan is questioning the RCMP on what they're doing to address human trafficking. Gazan is chair of the Standing Committee on the Status of Women. She brought her concerns forward during a meeting on human trafficking of women, girls and gender diverse people. We know that over half of the cases of sex trafficking, we know that no suspect is identified. This was in a report by um, StatsCan, um, March uh, 31st, 2021. 
uh, to, and that two-thirds of cases result in criminal proceedings being stopped with the decision of state withdrawn, dismissed, or discharged uh, cases. Um, what is the RCMP doing about this in terms of, you know, compiling appropriate evidence so that these cases don't fall through the cracks? Um, the RCMP endeavours to investigate all um, um, reported or found uh, human trafficking cases or all investigations. Um, we use the tools that are provided. We have recently updated our human trafficking policy that includes uh, guidance for investigations. And uh, furthermore, uh, we are um, working with uh, survivors of human trafficking to strengthen our investigative uh, policies and procedures. Well, we want to hear what you think about the stories you've seen to start our show tonight because it'll continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca or you can leave us a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. All right, we have to put a pause on the news for a moment, but still to come, a financing group floats a solution to First Nations housing. These monies would build 12,000 homes or provide clean, reliable energy or provide schools or health centers. Welcome back to APTN National News. The First Nations Finance Authority says it has a new solution to address poor infrastructure on reserve. Currently, not enough is being spent for adequate housing, schools and health centres. At a press conference in Ottawa on Wednesday, the Finance Authority asked the federal government for a guaranteed annual funding of $200 million a year for 20 years. That guaranteed funding could then be used to secure loans from the private market. CEO Bernie Daniels believes $3.6 billion could be raised this way. These monies would build 12,000 homes or provide clean, reliable energy, or provide schools or health centers. The gap would start closing. Spring harvests of caribou are underway in the Northwest Territories. Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs checks in with the Clicho Nation to see how their boots on the ground monitoring program is supporting safe, legal, and respectful hunts. Two decades ago, Jimmy Mantla wouldn't have had to glass the barren lands for echo, caribou. But mines, animal predation, modern hunting methods and climate change have desecrated the Bathurst herd in the Northwest Territories. From half a million in 1986 to just around 6,000 in 2021, a devastating decrease of nearly 99%. 90s, 95, 90s. There used to be lots of caribou and where we left Pachi, Chivesacon, all the whole summer everything burned. That caribou, it didn't go to the burn no more. They don't pass that burden, they don't pass that tree line because they got no food. Matla is part of the third annual Clinchell Government Echo Barren Ground Caribou Monitoring Program. The program runs in March for the duration of the Tibet to Kuntoito Winter Road, stretching 400 kilometers north of Yellowknife. Six staff are stationed at camp, encouraging harvests rooted in traditional values. Like the other day, somebody knocked down the musk ox, and, and you know, it's heavy too, the musk ox meat, and so they had to drag it with the snow machine across, trying to get close to the, their, and we explained to them that you cannot drag, uh, it's, it's just a tradition in that. Responding to the decline in population, in 2015, the Territorial Department of Environment and Natural Resources and co-management partners developed a mobile management zone. In the no hunting zone, boundaries change weekly, 
according to Caribou caller tracking data. Make sure your fuel's topped up. Well, that's good. ECHO Supervisor Lloyd Brabiska says the majority of hunters are harvesting in a respectful way, but the management zone means hunters must travel long distances by skidoo. Whoever decides this, uh, what decision is made for the mobile zone, needs, they need to educate the public more. It's not just the main herd, it's just a little group that's left behind. They're trying to protect us all too, to, to catch up to the main herd. And that's why the zoning is bigger. It's like a design, so it's all open area to go hunting. Monitor Jarvis Lamuel says it's critical for Klichon people to collect their own data on individual and community hunts to see if there's a strain from over harvesting. Wokwiti is like 300 people there, and if they're going to go commute to other centers, they'll shoot like 50 for them, for that community and they give out caribou to whoever needs. Like, particularly there's like close to 5,000 people now. If they do community hunt there, they'll be shooting like 100 for the community. And it's not just monitors supporting hunters. The program also ensures youth like Kobe Grosko are trained up. Some have been hunting here a long time, like their fathers and their grandfathers, and it keeps going. Like some don't even need a GPS because they just go by the lakes. Yeah, I'd say there's a growing gap because I know people my age who like don't even know the basics to come out here. What keeps the next generation hopeful for caribou recovery? Combining modern with traditional practices. Charlotte Mar Jacobs, ABTN National News, Contoito Winter Road. Meanwhile, Manitoba's latest flood outlook is warning the province could see major flooding along the Red River in the coming weeks. The outlook says the increased risk is the result of record snowfall in the U.S. along the Red River Basin. The province is warning flood risks will depend on the weather conditions between now and the spring melt. The Red River floodway is expected to go into operation this spring to reduce water levels within Winnipeg. A two-day conference is gathering in Saskatchewan to I examine excuse me, identity fraud. Lawyer Jean Taye joins me now to discuss the conference. Jean, we appreciate you taking some time here on our news show. Uh, can you tell us about the forum and, and how it came about? The forum is, this is the second uh, annual forum, and the forum is a collection of academics and I think administrators from universities all across the country who are all dealing with the issue of Indigenous identity fraud. So we had the first one last year and of course it was on Zoom as we were all doing. Um, and so this is the first time we've been able to have the opportunity to meet in person. And uh, so the, the topic is Indigenous identity fraud in the academy and how do you deal with it? Well, just like you mentioned, universities are grappling with how to handle Indigenous verification. So what are some of the practices the forum is exploring? Well, we're trying to look, first of all, I think, you know, we need to understand why it happens and where it's happening and who's doing it and how it manifests. And then that enables us to start thinking about, okay, how do you put in policies uh, how do you deal with people who are already embedded? So there, there's really a two-pronged problem here, which is, the first one is how do you stop new people who are as falsely assuming an Indigenous identity from coming in in the first place? That's maybe the easy problem, right? Because you just add tougher verification systems. The deeper problem and the more complicated one is for the, those who are already embedded in the university system. And I have heard Dr. Kim Talbear estimate, um, although she says she doesn't have hard numbers, just a basic estimate, that 25% of the Indigenous faculty across the country are not, are fakes. And okay. since there's only about 1% of Indigenous faculty across the country, if you take 25% of them and say they're fakes, that so that's a serious issue. Well, Jean, uh, who are some of the participants, uh, you know, at this forum? A, a really broad range of academics. Uh, I think that's the primary group uh, from all across the country. But they seem to be from all kinds of different um, 
disciplines. I've met people from public policy. I've met people from um, history. I've met people from other education programs. But there's also administrators. There are the people who are in charge, uh, you know, in the provost's offices and things like that, who are the ones who have to create the policies and uh, establish the mechanisms for how you deal with this. So it's a broad mixture of those kinds of people. We also have um, elders here. There's an elders panel going on as we speak right now um, because elders are very much involved in the universities these days. So um, it's always interesting and uh, learning um, opportunity to hear what they have to say. And last one for you here, Jean. Why was it important that uh, this is an all Indigenous space? I think that we need the opportunity, first of all. So, so the, I think the way to think about this Indigenous identity fraud is, first of all, to understand that this is actually white people. Uh, I use the word white loosely, but it's white people who are falsely assuming an Indigenous identity. But the problem is that we're the ones who have to deal with it. We're the ones who have to set up the, the barriers and barricades. And so in this way, I tend to think of it sort of like um, domestic abuse. The abuser is almost always the man, but it's the women who have to deal with it, right? So it's similar to that. This is abuse by people who are coming into the university, taking advantage of things. It's fraud, and fraud is the intentional deception to gain a material benefit. And so it's fraud, but it's the indigenous peoples who have to deal with it. So the idea that we can have a sort of a conference where we can figure out what we think are the best ways for us to deal with it that respect our ways of identifying indigenous people, because that's primarily what has to be um, respected and protected by the university. So, but if the university doesn't know because we're not very good at articulating what we think Indigenous identity is, then it's harder for them to work with us. So I think it's important for Indigenous people to get together, to get our vocabulary and our, our ideas lined up so that we can express it clearly who Indigenous people are. Then we can help the university. To, to deal with the problem of the white people who are coming in because they don't know, right? They, like most people in the university are not indigenous, so they have no clue how to, how to identify indigenous people properly. So I think it's important for us to come together first before we branch out and bring in non-indigenous people. Well, certainly plenty to think about, Jean. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. All right, we have to step aside one more time. Photo of the day and weather are next. Plus, northern BC will soon have high-speed internet thanks to new investments. We're happy to have an opportunity where our First Nation is going to be able to develop it and uh, control and have the benefits of, of uh, operating this system. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. It's the biannual snow festival in Nunavik, and along with performances, competitions, and many traditional activities, there's also some snow carvings. So how about this snow carving of someone carving snow? If you have some great pictures, be sure to send them our way by email to share at aptn.ca. You can send your photos to shareatptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. All right, now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. We start on the east coast, zero in Charlottetown and plus one in Halifax. Minus four in Snow and Cartwright and minus one in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Zero degrees in Quebec City and four in Montreal. Ten in Toronto and six degrees in North Bay. 1 degree in Wawa and 3 in Thunder Bay. Minus 14 in Churchill and minus 2 in Norway House. 0 degrees in Barron's River and minus 4 in Winnipeg. Saskatoon is clear in 0 and clear in 0 in North Battleford. 3 degrees in La Ronge and minus 4 in Stony Rapids. Making our way west, minus 4 in Fort Chippewan and 3 degrees in Grand Prairie. 8 degrees in Edmonton and 7 in Calgary. 
10 degrees in Tofino and 13 in Kamloops. 6 degrees in Sandspit and 0 in snow in Fort Nelson. 5 in Whitehorse and 5 in Mayo. Norman Wells is minus 5 and Yellowknife is minus 10. Looking at snow and minus 7 in Fort McPherson and clear and minus 11 in Colville Lake. Cambridge Bay looking like minus 24 in snow and minus 19 in Chesterfield. Minus 25 in Arctic Bay and a minus 17 in Iqaluit. Well, the spring season is officially here, and on In Focus today, we learned how different nations across the country celebrate the spring e equinox. Here's a look at this week's episode. So one of the, the Niska beliefs is that if the crescent moon is facing upward at the star, that they're going to have a good harvesting season. And that means they're going to have abundance of ulekin, salmon, berries. That's when they know they can share their preserves with other people. There's a lot of healing that happens in the spring, a lot of letting go, like from the winter. For us as Indigenous people, it's the beginning of, of something new, a new season, new life, right? A time to, to plant, yes. Every, every year uh, you tap maple trees and uh, you, you, you get sap and you boil it down to, to maple syrup and then you, make, uh, you can even boil it down even further uh, to, to get candy. It's a special type of ceremony that uh, we do at this time of the year. It's a, it's a spring equinox and uh, we want to acknowledge that because it's a new beginning. It's a, it's a new, new life ahead of us. This new beginning, this new life brings us closer to, uh, to being uh, compassionate about each other. High-speed internet is on the way for remote communities in northern British Columbia. In a press release, the province said they would invest $3 million in more reliable internet access to Gitniao and the neighboring town of Stewart. According to BC, high-speed internet will provide the two communities a better access to learning, jobs, and services like telehealth. The project will be built and operated by a partnership owned by Gitanyao First Nation. Last year, BC partnered with the federal government to provide up to more than $800 million to connect all rem remaining rural and First Nation households in BC. That plan is expected to be complete by 2027. Doing something on uh, a smaller scale that involves First Nation opportunity rather than where these typically all go to the larger major companies that, that scoop up all of these opportunities and, and so we're happy to have an opportunity where our First Nation is going to be able to develop it and uh, control and have the benefits of, of uh, operating this system. All right, that's all we have for you tonight on APTN National News. If you missed any of our stories tonight or you want a bit more information, you can check out our website, aptnnews.ca. For all of us here, I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night.